Welcome to The Untold Story, everybody. I'm Martha McCallum, and it's great to have you join our podcast today. I'm really glad to be joined today by Philippe Reines, who is a, a fairly frequent guest on our show and someone who I always like to hear from about the Democratic perspective on the 2024 election. So, Philippe, welcome. Thank you for having me, Martha. So you're you're the former deputy assistant secretary of state and former spokesman for Hillary Clinton. Uh, you have been around Democratic politics for a long time. You know all of the landscape really well. But for those who might not be familiar with your background, I always like to start this because it's called the called the untold story. Tell us a little bit about yourself and, and you know, the framework through which you, you got here. That is a good question. Um, I have to think back a little bit. Um, I'm at the age where my memory is slipping a bit. I (laughs) took, I think I'll do this quick. I I took a while to finish college. Um, But while I was taking my time, I worked in banking and finance for about seven or eight years, which later came in handy during the financial crisis. I tended to understand terms and ideas better than a lot of people who worked on the Hill did. Um, and then I got the political bug in 2000 when I was finally graduating college at age 29. And I actually, you know, I had not had any exposure. I never worked for a campaign, never anything. Rudy Giuliani had been mayor for two terms. I actually think I voted for him three times. I voted for him in 1989 when he lost his first mayoral bid. And I, you know, I remember John McCain, I graduated from Columbia. I remember John McCain coming to campus and I was just wowed by him. And I always had been. And I think it probably was the first time I really became where I was at a point where I had to ask myself, am I a Democrat or Republican? I'm not sure how I came to the conclusion, but I ended up in Nashville, Tennessee, working for Al Gore. And from there, it was just sort of natural trajectory. It was score to, I worked in New York politics for a year in the 2001 mayoral election, um, including on 9-11 when it was the Democratic primary. And obviously it was 9-11 um, and lived in New York. And it was obviously a devastating time. And then made my way to D.C., worked on the House of Representatives for a woman named Jane Harmon from California. And then made my way sure. to the Senate working for Hillary Clinton. And then it kind of I think you picked it up from there. It's 12, 13, 14 years formally working for Hillary. And since then, it's informal, you know, still keep in touch with her. We WhatsApp, you know, sometimes it's, <laughs> as, sometimes it's as consequential as a poll. And sometimes like this morning, it's about the panda bears possibly coming back to San Diego. <laughs> um, did you grow up in New York, Philippe? And um, I'm just curious what your what your background, your family background is, Philippe Reines, explain, um, you, you know, your background. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not French, which is always an important <laughs> point to make. I think when I'm, I'm talking to um, an audience that, you know, calls French fries, freedom fries, my mother's father's name was Philip. And I think she just liked the derivation. I've never particularly understood. Um, I'm glad that it's a little unique, although it's being unique has its downsides and that if someone says my name in a room and someone overhears it, they, there's no, there's no plausible deniability that it's not talking about me, but I grew up, um, the upper west side of Manhattan, uh, 90th and Columbus to be exact back in the days when New York was not the New York of today, when it was the New York of 2000 murders a year and 90th and Columbus was North of the safe line. Mm-hmm. Nothing ever happened to me, but, you know, you knew which streets to walk on or which streets right. not to walk on. And I think, you know, I was lucky I went to private school in Manhattan. And uh, I think that's probably about it. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting um, hearing your background. And, you know, you said you voted for Rudy Giuliani as a born and bred New Yorker um, and witnessed uh the most horrific day in recent history, 9-11, uh, as a New Yorker, which we can relate to, a lot of us. Um, in terms of, you know, when you said you sort of reached a point where you had to figure out, are you a Democrat, are you a Republican, when you entered working in, in politics, when you look at, at the party today, do you feel like it 
represents you still. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about how the party has pulled more progressive, but do you think that's the reality? I mean, it, it definitely has the same way that the, you know, grand old party has in a lot of ways been pulled right. I'm not sure there's anyone in either party that agrees with every part of the platform or every, you know, elected official. I would not self-describe as a progressive. There are tons of things I don't agree with and tons of people that I don't agree with. On the whole, I, especially now, agree with my party more than not. But I remember a time, you know, I know that the words and the name Hillary Clinton bring a certain amount of partisan wincing to a good chunk of the country. But when she was a senator, you know, people were expecting her to just be this Democratic firebrand. And I remember I started with her in 2002. And by 2004, we had looked at the list of every senator that had been in uh, in office in 1998 when her husband was impeached and every Republican and how they voted. And then a few more like Lindsey Graham, who had been a House yeah. impeachment manager. And she had worked with every single one of them in one yeah. way or another. Um, I and that's, remember that. that's the way it was. And I, I remember, you know, one of the last ones was uh, Trent Lott. And Trent Lott during her 2000 campaign had said, you know, lightning will strike me before I work with Hillary Clinton. And then it, he said, you know, he brought an umbrella to their first <laughs> their first meeting and said, I got to worry about lightning. So that was a different, that you know, and I, you. look, yeah. I, I, I lost, I worked for Gore and I lost to Bush and I, you know, can go on and on about that election, but I didn't wake up every day hating George Bush. Just, right. you know, it was a different time. You know, I'm curious what you think about this, because when you talk about Hillary Clinton and her resume, which was extensive, an excellent resume for anybody who wants to run for president of the United States. And then, you know, there's all these theories around, oh, you know, Michelle Obama wants to be president. She's going to sort of sweep in at convention time and become the nominee. And people say, well, you know, Hillary Clinton ran for president. She was the first lady, but she had it you know, she was secretary of state. She was a United States senator. She had an um, extensive experience in politics that went back to the Watergate Commission. So um, what do you make of it when people say that comparison? And do you think that Michelle Obama is qualified to run for president if she and do you think she has any desire to jump in? Well, I'll work backwards. I mean, no one's jumping into anything, whether they're named Obama or Newsom or uh, Buddha judge, it just doesn't, I mean, you know, it just doesn't work that way. There might've been a day where the parties picked their people, but since then it's been a primary process. And I think the Republican party has something like 1900 or 2000 delegates. So we have 4,000 plus delegates. The idea that there's, I mean, I, I spent a fair amount of time having this conversation with my closest friends and, and any Democrat, it's just not, happening. It's just not plausible. <laughs> we have a nominee the same way they, that the Republicans have a nominee. Neither of them have been officially dubbed as such, but no one's going anywhere. So, you know, that's the specifics of it. And I'm happy to, you know, well, you know, just kind of game out why it's not possible. And even if it were going to happen, Kamala Harris would almost certainly be the nominee. So the idea that President Biden would either choose to step down or be forced to step down and that Kamala Harris would be skipped over, it's, it's a fantastical idea, but it's something that every four years, both parties go through because the idea of a broker convention is so, so good. Um, I think if Michelle Obama wanted to run for president, she absolutely should. I think Laura Bush, if you want to run for president, absolutely should. I mean, these are people who are incredibly talented and why they, in the cases of Mrs. Obama, Mrs. Bush, didn't hold elected office. I mean, when you're first lady of the United States for eight years, you are as qualified to do really any job as anyone in the country. But Michelle Obama is not going to be. I mean, this came up four years ago, too, where I think sure. you know, people people whispering in, in uh, former President Trump's ears that Michelle Obama was going to be the nominee. I always crack up about this because how would a Republican know to tell <laughs> Donald Trump something that we don't know? I mean, it's just it, it's always the people in their own party who are somehow giving the inside scoop about the other party. 
Yeah, no, I agree. I, you know, I also just remember it, it just seems anecdotally based on the things that she said then she was not very excited about living in the White House all the time. And she said she really looked forward to going back to her private life. I don't think she's so, she certainly is on the scene. She has a popular podcast and she gave a really probably the biggest moment speech at the Democratic National Convention the last time around. So, I mean, clearly she's a star, but I don't know. I, I, you I, know, I, think, I don't I see the hunger see to be president in her that that some people see, but maybe I'm wrong. I think when you've lived in the White House and you are essentially a partner, whether it's a junior partner, however you want to put it, you see the good and the bad. You see the good that the presidency, that the office can do, but you also see the horrific. I mean, I'm sure she we've all seen the photos of President Obama's hair color, you know, in in, uh, God, I can't remember 2009 versus when he left in 2017. I'm sure she noticed it, too. It happens to everyone. Yeah. It's, it's a and nice, they had, you know, region. they had two young, they had two young daughters living in the White House, and they had a number of security challenges and people breaching the walls. I mean, I, I think people have a very, I think when you've been there, you have a very healthy dose of reality. And but, you know what? You get to a point where you're allowed to enjoy your life, and they have so many ways of doing good that um, I don't. It's not a binary choice between doing nothing or being president. Do you think it's something and, she's interested in at all? What's your feel? I, I mean, I have no insight into it, but no, I don't think. Okay. So. You know, let, let's talk a little bit about this matchup because you have pointed out that, you know, Trump's only a few years younger than Biden. And we know yeah. from all the polls that, you know, s- roughly 60 percent don't want either one of them yeah. uh, wouldn't be their first choice to run. So. You know, it does beg the question, uh, you know, you say, look, this this is done. This is set in stone. These two are running against each other. It's going to be Trump Biden. Yep. But we do have these sort of third party elements out there. No labels is apparently still looking for a candidate. I, I talked to Nikki Haley the other day on my show and I said, you know, the speech that you just gave at noon that day where she said she was absolutely still in the race didn't focus a whole lot on running as a Republican shouldn't use that word a lot in it. Um, And it made some people say, well, she sounds like a third party candidate to me. So I asked her and her answer included the sentence. I am running as for the Republican nomination right now. Yeah. So do you see anything brewing there? What are you picking up? I, I can't imagine that she would drop and pick up a no labels or any kind of third party candidacy. Um, I don't even know that no labels would consider her as someone that's in the middle to the extent that they think there are people in the middle. Well, well, they want a Republican and a Democrat. And they say that she said that they had reached out to her, but you also have these sore loser laws in 20 States where if you have run in the primary process, you, uh, you can't get on their ballot. So it would be complicated to be sure if it's even possible. I have to admit, I did not know that. And I guess it's kind of a good yeah. rule. Um, look, she has a very, very, very narrow path, basically trying to get through a pinhole. You know, if she were to somehow win the nomination, and if she were to win the nomination, it would be really because of Donald Trump's doing, that either his circumstances would um, get the better of him with voters or something more calamitous. She would need, well, first, she would have a problem identifying his core base, who would probably see her as someone who, well, it's first of all, not Donald Trump, but also took some hard shots at her. And she would probably see a need to cobble together a coalition of the president's, former president's base, the Republican, whatever you want to call the non Trump base, but still Republicans and loathing voting for a Democrat or loathing the choices. And then that sliver in the middle. But I I think the the third party question is less an issue about whether it's an option for her than it is about how it affects the nominees, whoever they are, because the biggest difference between 2016 and 2020, well, there are a lot of differences, but the main one on this point is 
in 2016, you had a number of third party candidates, most notably um, Jill Stein and, and Gary Johnson. And they took a, a fair amount of votes. And, you know, I remember doing the math of the three states that Hillary lost that Democrats had held for so long, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. And she lost by a margin far, far smaller than votes that either Johnson or Stein had taken away. And it is safe to assume that the people who voted for the third party would have gone for Democrat the same way that Ralph Nader hurt Al Gore in 2000, the same way that Pat Buchanan hurt George H.W. Bush. And, you know, I, I bumped into an unnamed pollster who has worked for both parties last night at LaGuardia Airport. And he was saying that his data was showing that Robert Kennedy Jr.'s support is basically coming um, at the expense of the Biden campaign by about 60 percent and out of the Trump campaign, about 40 percent. So this is the wild card when you I mean, just look at the margins of the last few elections. I mean, we, they're just they're tight as a tick and you just don't right. have the margin of these swings. I mean, Robert Kennedy Jr. is polling at 8 percent and, and he's yes. not going to be president. Like, I understand the concept, but just at the end of the day, I and I'd like to think a lot of people are practical. He's not going to be president. So what is the point of this? He's not changing. He's not impacting the debate. And you really have to ask why people do it. And I'm sure he believes in what he's saying, but he might end up contributing to the election of the person that he disagrees with more. And I don't, I don't see the point of that. And I think this year in particular, it's, it's different because there's going to be a protest vote more pronounced than 2016 or 2020. Well, exactly. Of, and, you know, when you look at some yeah. of the other examples that you mentioned of Perot and other third party tries in those yeah. elections, I'm fairly sure. I mean, I, you know, the dissatisfaction with the candidates was not near the levels that it is now. Yeah. Yeah. And the circumstances, I mean, I mean does, with, doesn't with, that present a different opportunity? Because, yeah, I mean, when you have, you know, 44 percent, I think, in New Hampshire said that they would never vote for Donald Trump um, yeah. in the in the GOP primary. You have fertile ground there that I have never seen exist in the you know six presidential elections that I have covered. So it, it seems to me that there's potential for sort of for a spoiler who has some significance. And I and I think it's interesting that that split, according to your pollster friend, is 60 40, because I hear a lot of particularly young conservative voters who are very yeah. interested in RFK Jr. You know, they probably listen to because a lot of, of podcasts, his vaccine, being, you know, Joe Rogan folks. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm sure I, that's I, part of it. But I also think yeah. that um, they like somebody younger and, you know, who seems like they have some more energy <laughs> for one thing. Yeah, I, I, um, look, I mean, you know, you know I mean, I, I, I think show. there's so many people who just don't want any anything to do with either of these candidates. So, well, um, you know I, I just think it's they're, a unique environment. Stuck. I don't think it's. I, yeah. Uh, it, it yeah, just, I guess. It, it, so maybe either they stay home or they vote for another candidate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll see. I mean, we'll. I, I think you're right, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if there is some sort of factor here that no one anticipates that becomes a large factor, well, but, but I don't know what it is. So I'm just hanging in there yeah, to find the out. X, well, the, the X factor is one we haven't talked about. We've never had, I mean, there are incredibly unique things about this election. They do seem to be getting um, tighter and more vicious and more everything every four years. But the, what we're experiencing here that we've never experienced before is a candidate that's been indicted, you know, whatever the number is, 90 something or 101. And that's that's a wild mm -hmm. card more than Joe Biden. I mean, Joe Biden, you can kind of look at what it is, the economic factors, what's going on in the Middle East. Um, but, you know, even he's got four criminal trials. You have any one of them not just go the wrong way, but unfold in a noisy way. And you got a problem. And yeah, but they, much every poll they've helped him there, so far. You know, I mean, well, they're they're you know, juicing I, his numbers on the GOP side. There's no doubt about it. And they made it very difficult for what looked at one point like a, a real lane for Ron DeSantis um, completely fell apart because the more he was in court and the more he looks like he's getting attacked and people are trying to take him out 
the more it generates, you know, loyalty for him. For his base, not for the Democratic Party, not for yeah, but his numbers have grown. His polls have gone well, up. Well, I know. I mean, look, I think so that's Santos outside was, of the, you know, 36 percent that he's always had solidly. Now he's, you know, 42, 44. But you but you have polling that shows that somewhere between 30 and 40 percent would not be happy, even if, you know, that abandoned him if he would have found guilty in any of these things. But I don't I don't mean it that way in the sense that I think everyone forgets that these two men have faced off before and Joe Biden won. And there are reasons that have carried over that I, I think will prevail. Um, that doesn't we'll mean look, I think this is, this is I, a, I mean, they this also have prospect. four years of Biden in office that they didn't yeah. have to look at before. And I think well, a lot look, of people thought that there was going to be this unifying of the country. It was going to be like this, you know, sort of very paternal, um, experienced president that was going to bring the country together. And that clearly has not happened. So that's going to be in the backdrop. Um, you know, the experience of the last four years will certainly be a factor as well. Um, but I want to ask you about what's happening in these, um, but particularly in the the black and Hispanic polling and yeah. the cities in the country. Look at New York, for example, where uh, Biden's lead in the most recent polling is down to 12 points in New York. There's a 27% yeah. advantage in Democrat enrollment in New York and only a 12 point gain for Biden. What's going on there? Well, I should preface this since I'm not on video that I am whiter than white and I'm a male. So I'm, I'm basically about the least qualified person to talk about what people of color do. That said, I think a couple of things on the Hispanic side, um, you know, Latinos have never been the unified voting bloc that the African-American community has been because you, first of all, you know, you could, you could have 10 people of Latino, Hispanic, um, you know, lineage in a room and they wouldn't even agree on what words to use because it's from so many different countries, basically almost different variations of language. And a lot of those factors, no pun intended, trump other factors. So, you know, you have a lot of Latinos who are, you know, very devout Catholics and that moves them into a pro-life um, position that then aligns with Republicans. So I would just make that difference with between the two communities. The black community has been more of a monolith um, in terms of voting. And it's it's actually it's black men that have been shifting more than black women. Um, and I've worked with and pretty much for black women my entire political career. And it's true when they say, you know, listen to black women, they know what's what's what. Um, I, I don't know. I think there's, I think the dynamic that is kicking in, I, I mean, and the world's upside down in terms of who is part of what party, um, mm -hmm. the party, we were the party of, you know, union members who might not have been college educated. And now that's flipped. We are the, you know, it's really the biggest distinction in party affiliation has turned out to be education, level of education. And I think that is permeating every demographic. It doesn't make a difference. Man, woman, black, white, Hispanic, uh, Catholic, Jewish. It is coming down to education. And it might um, be coming to certain communities slower than others. But I, I think on the whole, people like me become too simplistic about entire communities the same way you know, you look at the Jewish community for years, there are Jews who are, you know, hardcore Republicans, whether it's because of Israel or because of taxes. And then you have Jews that are hardcore Democrats. The Untold Story continues right after this. Well, aren't you saying that it's a, it has been a mistake to look at these groups as um, you know, attached to their identity. Identity politics is the common term that we use to talk about this because people don't like to be put in boxes and they don't like to hear that they, you know, the assumption is that they're going to vote for this party or that party based on those identities. And I think that the more people become, you know, the longer generations spend in this country, the more they are 
Americans. And they care about the same things that every other group cares about, which is safety, prosperity, the ability to get ahead, all of those things. And I think that, you know, I, I, my mind goes back to um, President Biden in that interview with Charlemagne the God saying, you know, if you don't know who you're going to vote for, you ain't black, which was very he, he became very very un- unhappy, very angry about that statement. It's a, it's a great generalization that was made by the current president there. And, and I think that's an idea that it really has hit home with a lot of black voters when they look at what's going on in their cities, when they look at what's going on with its immigration. You see all these town halls and council meetings in Chicago and across the country where people are just really unhappy with with government and you know, where it has left them as a result of this migration. Con- I, I think that's what's the, the dynamic. Well, One of the I, dynamics is driving this change. You just hit the nail on the head that the lowest common denominator in America right now is no one is really happy with the state of our government and more importantly, the state of the country. But I mean, I think just to be clear, there's no one in the Democratic Party who takes any vote for granted. So it's not OK X community, you voted 90 percent our way for three decades. What the hell is wrong with you for starting to move? If you I mean, the campaigns that I've worked on and probably Republican campaigns too, um, winning campaigns, you don't take anything for granted. You probably spend the most time making sure that your hardest core voters are the ones that turn out because what campaigns and parties learn over time is that when you start counting on people who don't regularly vote, you've got a problem. It's the people who vote in primaries, people who vote regularly. Um, you know, you can't, if you find a 40 year old that's never registered to vote, that's a tough blog to get them to the polls. I think with the black community in particular, some of the, of the attacks, um, particularly on Hillary in 2016 were pretty direct. I mean, they were taking terms. Um, I mean, obviously you have, criminal justice reform, which is probably one of the few things that Democrats would, in theory, agree with that Donald Trump um, accomplished. There are communities that benefit from that. And with Hillary, you know, there was a I don't even remember what it was, but she had used the term super predators in some context when she was first lady. And, you know, that was repurposed 20 years later as a pretty devastating hit. And, you know, President Biden um, face that to some degree too. just uh, work he did on uh, assault weapons. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. I don't there's no question that Joe Biden has really spent his entire career or Hillary Clinton working for every community. And, you know, I mean, the thing to go back to what I was saying before, I never doubted I didn't hate George Bush. And I probably the first president that I was really aware of was Ronald Reagan. and I liked him a lot. I never doubted that those guys woke up every day and were working for as many Americans as they could. Now, they, they weren't under any illusion that half of the country really didn't like them and probably a quarter of them despised them. But I never doubted that. And I guess my biggest gripe with Donald Trump, and at least he was sort of honest about it, was that there was no sense that he was waking up every day. He was just really thinking about his voters. I guess that's shrewd. But it's not necessary. Um, you know, Donald Trump didn't need to go down that road. He could have been more uh, unifying is, I think, too simplistic of a word. But he did not have to. This is someone it's what's strange to me. This is someone who has such an ironclad grip on his base and on his party, which have become pretty synonymous. And yet he feels the need to constantly tend to them and not take that that support out for a spin and see what else he can, he can get done. I mean, I'm not sure he has a feel for his base, but it's almost like he feels like he knows that it can be lost, which of course anything can happen. But again, trying would have been not bad. I mean, if he, you know, what's well, going, you know what's I mean, you know, up. there's some theories on that. And one is, um, you know, in terms of the legislation that he pursued and, you know, things he could have done that might have um, helped to bridge some of those gaps initially. Um, the other side is that he was, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, the knives were out for him on day one. So it put him in a very defensive mode, I think, starting very early on 
probably the day after the election um, in terms of, you know, this he's an illegitimate president and this can't stand. And, you know, he knows he didn't. I think Hillary said, you know, he knows he didn't win legitimately. All of that stuff. So, you know, and we've seen that on both sides. There's well, no doubt the, about it. The, it's gotten but really ugly, but, but I, I'm not sure he had any opportunity to. Um, and, well, and they, you know, I mean, there were definitely things that they did get some uh, some coordination on across the aisle. But um, it, it became I, I think post Trump politics is a completely different game than, you know, the, than the examples that you gave about Bush and prior presidents. We're, we're just in a completely different mode. And I, I want to get your thoughts on that before we wrap up, because I, I don't want to take too much more of your time. But I think, but I'm, I love no, talking no, no, to you. I, so, so go ahead. <laughs> I You know, just to that point, though, when you say the knives out, the knives were often in the hands of, you know, brutish and cashes. They were Republican. The first two years, he held both houses of Congress. You can't say that Nancy Pelosi was happy with Donald Trump, and she rhetorically thwarted him as much as she can. But look at the first real defeat of his presidency was was not overturning um, the American Care Act or Obamacare. And that was because of John McCain and the famous thumbs down and Susan Mm -hmm. Collins and uh, Lisa Murkowski. It was Republicans that undid that. So, yeah, when you get to 2018, you can you can. One can say that the Democrats were in a position to, you know, put up more roadblocks. But, you know, you talk about the six that you've covered and we've all lived through enough of them. But, you know, we haven't. None of us have lived through a former president taking on a current president. Absolutely. Because unless, unless you're I, 128. I agree. Yeah. Unless no, you're I, 128 I, I, years I, old. I'm, you haven't I'm glad seen you it. brought that up because I, I bring that up a lot as well, Philippe. And and. That is the unprecedented nature of this matchup. And so what you essentially have is, you know, roughly half the country who is voting for the, you know, an incumbent president. There's a there's a a four year gap where he was not president. But for them, this is their opportunity to reelect the person that they liked as president. And you have him going up against somebody who is, which is why it gets so confusing to say, you know, former president, president, former president, um, because generally we refer to someone who has been president as president, President Obama, okay. President Bush, President Clinton. It gets a little tricky in this environment. Um, and I think that that is one of the most salient characteristics of this matchup. And I think it's going to be fascinating. It's actually, to but, watch. but in a way, in a way, I make the argument that it's helpful because in a typical election, when we have, um, let's just say, a Bush, excuse me, a, a Obama and Romney. Sure, Romney had been a governor and that kind of thing. And you can make some judgments, but you still only know what one of the two would be as president. This is the first yeah. time in any of our lifetime that you've seen both as president. And um, that's a, in a way a much more educated sort of choice and you know the things that have been much talked about whether it's health and age you're the same person i'm sorry i i I get why it's a sexy comment but look they're both basically 80 years old it it, that's just the case they're both yeah but you know you know i said this yesterday but uh, uh, you know my dad is 91 okay he is one of the sharpest people i know he, you know, sees stories in the news before I do. He has uh, interesting takes on things that I, you know, love to listen to. He's super sharp. He has a lot of friends who are his age. Many of them are lovely people. They are just not in the same place in terms of mental ability. The number is not what matters. And, it, you know, if, if Joe Biden were 90 or 75, um, you know, people would be noticing what they're noticing, which is that he has lost a lot of his step, sometimes literally and other times. But you can look at video from two years ago and there's there's a big difference. And this isn't my opinion. This is just like, like observational. Like, but, you, I could put them like, up right now if I if we were on TV and I could show them to you. And yeah, you, no, I'm not, I'm not you gonna... can't tell me that you don't see that. No, he is walking slower. He, it, it, of course not. I can't make that any different than your father. Your father is probably walking slower than he did at 81. Absolutely. But you just said it. But there's no correlation between the two. I mean, that's the thing. I, I look, I am never around Joe Biden, but I am lucky enough, particularly on this issue, to have some of my closest and longest friends and former colleagues who are in the highest positions and see him all the time. And they're like, yeah, he's older, but this is just such a disconnect between what you're seeing and look you could take video of donald trump from a couple of months ago saying 
repeatedly that were close to World War II and go back 10 years and that's something he would say. Look, I remember in the 2016 election, people bringing up uh, interviews he did regularly with Larry King in the 90s and the early mm-hmm. aughts. Mm-hmm. And he was a different guy. I mean, people age. At some point, you of take... Of course they do. No, of course people, they do. No, but you take it, but your this is the question car keys for, away. You take your yeah, parents' I mean, car keys away. That doesn't mean that you take away everything about them. I mean, it, it, it's absolutely still... Absolutely not. Look, the, you know what? You and I, uh, you know, at voters across the country are the judge of this, right? So yeah. one one data point that we have is to look at the polling of what people say. You've got like 76 percent say that they don't think they think he's not fit for another term. Now, I don't know how that's going to play out on Election Day, but it's a factor that we look at as we you know, look toward all of this. What else do you see? They're not putting him out for interviews. He didn't do a Super Bowl interview. So it's he, funny. It's so you know, funny constantly you gets cut off by his own people. You know, OK, we got to go because they look to be protecting him. And that's not a good look for voters. So it, it's funny you say that because I when's the last time Donald Trump did a press conference. How many well, he days did them almost every day. He stood in front of that. Uh, chop- uh, he no, couldn't no, wait no, to no, talk no. to answer people's questions. He couldn't wait no, to answer no. people's questions. Four years he ago. Talked the last time he, off the why cup, isn't he giving one tomorrow? Time. Oh, well, he does them in and out of these rallies. I did a pull aside with him the other night in New Hampshire. He does plenty of, you know, like very. I'm talking about this crazy sort of this, this, this notion of like, oh, it's been 27 days since X has done Y. Apply it to both. When's the last time that Donald Trump did a network interview? I mean, I'm not, Just did one the other I'm not night. advocating. Yeah. I'm not advocating. I'm not at or any of the looks Donald Trump has done NBC or CBS. President Biden has done Fox. They, there's there. I mean, I guess like what's well, maybe that's why you have such here. large numbers of people who don't want either one of them and right. think I, that, look, you know, not, it wouldn't be my it wouldn't be my media plan. Frankly, it wouldn't be my media plan for either of them. But this is the thing. <laughs> These are the guys. I mean, we can talk about as many scenarios we want and people not being happy, I hate to break it to the 60% that don't want any of them. That's, that's who they got. You have to make well, a decision on what is. Look, if you want to make a decision on they height, don't. then vote for yeah. Donald Trump. <laughs> but, if you but want the to make, you can do whatever they, you want. No, they, they can decide to stay home, which you they may could. see a lot of people do. That's going to be one of the most interesting numbers on election night, I think, for all of us. Or you're going to see um, people very juiced up to vote because they really don't want the other person. And then you're going to see a little bit of a third party factor that may become something, may not. We'll see. But um, I believe- think Democrats yeah, go. are going to shift after the convention when they can no longer say hmm. be Joe Biden. They're going to shift into full panic mode. And full anybody but Donald yeah, Trump mode. Yeah, I think you may be right about that. Yeah, and that's yeah. the excitement factor because <laughs> it's not coming from the candidates. Um, <laughs> there's going to be excitement to be sure. Philippe, thank yeah. you so much. Great no, to talk to you today, me. and look forward to having you on the show very soon. I'd Take love care. Bye bye, Philippe Brynas joining me. That is the untold story for today. I'm Martha McCallum. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to The Untold Story with Martha McCallum. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Make sure to rate and review. For more podcasts, go to foxnewspodcast.com. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts. And Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app.